Welcome everyone. We're going to get started at the top of the hour. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. We're gonna to give people a little bit more time to join, about a minute or so. Okay, great. Well, people um, are joining. I just wanted to welcome you to Graph Gurus 54. And um, we have Dan Barkas um, doing an overview of Pi Tiger Graph um, using uh, Google Collab. And there's a few housekeeping items before we get started today. And Dan, if you can just advance to the next slide, that'd be great. Okay, so Obviously, everyone is muted right now. So if you have any questions, please use um, the Q&A tab in Zoom to ask any content related questions. If you're having any kind of issues with Zoom, you can um, go ahead and just reach out to me uh, via the panelist chat. But if you could use Q&A for any content related questions, that would be great. We have Jonathan, Herp he's um, here helping us um, run the Q&A. And uh, we are recording the webinar right now and we will email you all the links and the slides and the recording and everything afterwards um, later today. And again, if you have any issues, just go ahead and reach out to me. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started and go ahead and have Dan introduce himself. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Dan Barkus. I'm a developer advocate here at TigerGraph. Um, I've been working here for a relatively short amount of time, the last three or four months, but I've been working with Tiger Graph for a little over two years now as part of some of my past experience working at Optum. Um, I'm currently working on producing a lot of educational content for Tiger Graph uh, through demos and videos and all sorts of stuff like that. So I've um, been working on that a lot as well. So I guess we'll just sort of jump into what we'll be covering in this webinar. So we'll mainly be walking through uh, Pi Tiger Graph. This is our Python Tiger Graph plugin to allow you to uh, interact with your Tiger Graph instance, whether that be Tiger Graph Cloud or your own dedicated Tiger Graph instance from Python. Uh, so we'll be following along with this Google Colab. Um, I can drop the link to this in the chat for anyone who wants to uh, follow along as well. But this will be um, this is our general uh, intro to. Uh, 
PyTiger Graph, and it kind of goes through all of the functionality of PyTiger Graph, how to use it, and um, how you can use that to enrich your Tiger Graph experience. So without further ado, I'm just going to be jumping into that uh, collab and uh, starting from there. So kind of the basis of this, we'll be working from, I'm assuming that you have some knowledge of Tiger Graph, uh, what Graph does, and when you would want to use it. And this uh, webinar will mainly just be covering using PyTiger Graph to interface with your Tiger Graph instance. Uh, so the first thing that we'll need to do or need to take note of is our instance itself. So I'll be using uh, Tiger Graph Cloud, the Tiger Graph Cloud uh, solution for this. Um, so you can just create a free account at tgcloud.io, uh, sign in there, and then we'll go ahead and create a solution. Uh, so when doing this, uh, we'll be starting with the uh, movie recommendation engine starter kit. So we have these great starter kits uh, that you can use with your Tiger Graph instances. They come preloaded with data and uh, queries and the schema and everything that you would need to get started with a Tiger Graph instance. Uh, you can select a free tier for this. You get one free tier instance uh, per account. So you do not need to spend any money in order to spin this up. And you can select wherever your closest region is. Um, and then from there, this is where we'll you'll start needing to uh, keep track of some of the changes that you're making. So we'll need to give our solution name. I'm just going to call this one um, PyTiger Graph uh, tag. You can tag it for easier uh, selection by you. Ours is pre-tagged just because we're using a um, one of those starter kits. The initial password, you can set a password for yourself uh, just so you can use that to log in. And then the important part here is going to be your subdomain. So this is the address that we'll use in order to connect to our Tiger Graph Cloud instance through PyTiger Graph. Um, so we would call this something like uh, Tiger Graph. These all have to be leave lowercase. And then you could go ahead and select next and you can create your solution. I've already created one, so I'm just going to hop into that solution so we can get started. It takes about three minutes for a solution to spin up. Um, so we'll just hop in from here. So here we have our Tiger Graph solution. We can see that we already have our schema in place because we started with that starter kit. And if we switch over to our default graph, we can see uh, everything on that as well. So what we'll do now is connect uh, through PyTiger Graph. So you'll want to take note of your subdomain here, so your URL. So we can see that ours is tg101.i.tigercloud.io. So we'll just copy that because we will need it in our collab. So here we are in Google Collabs, and we're going to be getting uh, connecting to PyTiger Graph. So the first thing we'll want to do is install PyTiger Graph. It's available through pip, so you can just pip install it um, with pip install PyTiger Graph. And that will get it installed on our box. And then we'll need to import it into Python as well. So import PyTiger Graph as TG. And then we're also going to import JSON and Pandas just to help us out with some of the things that we'll be demoing here. So in this next section, we're going to actually set up our connection parameters. So we have our, we'll need our host name. This is that subdomain that I was talking about. So for this one, we have uh, TG101. Uh, .i.tigercloud.io. Our graph name is my graph, and we can see that again by going up here. It's our default graph name. And then our username is tigergraph, and our password is also tigergraph. Uh, for a secret, so some of the operations that you can use PyTigerGraph for will require an, a secret for authentication. Uh, not everything that you do requires a secret, so only operations that involve augmenting data. Uh, will require a secret for authentication. Everything else can just be done by logging in through your graph. But since we're going to be creating uh, vertices and edges and uploading and parsing data, we will need our secret. So there's a couple different ways that you can get this. You can either get it through PyTiger Graph itself. After you've established a connection, you can create a secret, or you can do it through your um, Graph Studio admin portal. So if we click the admin button here, we can then view our admin page. We can create an alias for our new secret, uh, demo secret. We can click plus, and then uh, we can just copy that over. 
and there we have our secret. So we'll just set those variables and then we'll establish our connection to our Tiger Graph server with tg.tigergraph connection. And then we'll feed in our host name, username, password. And we could also include our um, secret as well. But we'll get to that in a second. So we'll connect with our basic connection. And now we can get our auth token from our secret. So here we're going to use our connection to get a token using the secret variable that we had set before. And we're just going to print that token out. Realistically, you wouldn't want to do this, but there it is, should anyone like to connect to my graph. So now that we have that token, we're going to establish our full connection using our host name, our graph name, username and password, as well as our API token. So this is, is necessary for doing those advanced features like loading and um, deleting any data that we have on our graph. So we've established that connection now. And now we'll get into some of the features that PyTiger Graph offers to allow you to get an overview of your graph. So the first thing we'll want to look at is the schema. So this is in general, all of the vertices and edges of our schema described uh, with all of their attributes for us. So we can see that we have some vertex types and those are person and movie. And we can see that our person vertex here uh, does not have any attributes. It has a primary ID name, which is a string, but our movie vertex here has some attributes uh, that are ID, genre, and title. Edge types, we can see uh, similar stuff as well. So we can kind of parse through this and we can see a little bit of information about it, but it's all very, it's all in one place. Um, so one thing that we can do is we can get a little bit more information in a more concise type. So we have our get vertex type function here, which will allow us, which will just return our types of vertices. So we can see that we have a person vertex and a movie vertex. And we can also use get edge types here, and that will return just our edge types. Additionally, if we want some more information other than just the name, uh, we can use uh, get vertex type and then input our specific vertex type that we got from our previous request, we could get vertex types. So the types here returns a list of the names of all of your vertices uh, in your schema, whereas get vertex type takes an input of a string, which is one of those specific vertices. So when we run this, we can see that we get uh, a more concise output than our whole schema uh, that we had up here. Instead of all of this, we just get something that's a bit more uh, parsable. It's the same information, it's just less of it all at once. So uh, there's our vertex attributes and there's our edge attributes for our single edge uh, rating. So if it wasn't already um, apparent, our graph here is uh, handling uh, users rating movies. So if we look at our schema here, we have use, uh, persons and we have movies and an edge rating connecting them. So we can get um, a, some additional info. Uh, once again, it's all kind of the info in here, but you can get it in a bit more concise manner with some of these more specific uh, attribute uh, requests. So for here, we have get edge source vertex type, get edge target vertex type. So these are, as you can see from this JSON here, those are specified here to vertex type and from vertex type, but this will just return those. And then we can also get is directed. So that is the directionality of our edge. Uh, once again, is directed is in our overall edge and schema response, but these, uh, these functions just get those specific values from there if you're only looking for something like that. We can also get if it is a uh, directed edge, we can get the reverse edge name. Uh, so any directed edge will or can have a reverse edge, which is used for reverse traversal along that edge. So we can find out if it has one and what the name of that reverse edge is as well. So we can see that our edge rate is directed uh, because we have that is directed true uh, with the source vertex type of person and a target vertex type of movie. 
and the reverse edge is reverse rate. Uh, so that's just a general idea of what our schema looks like and some different functions that we can use to either get our broad schema as a whole or some more uh, exact attributes of our schema that we're looking for. So now that we have our schema, let's take a look at our data. So uh, we're creating a function here, get loaded stats, which will use some of our PyTiger graph functions in order to find out what is in our graph. So we have a get vertex count function, which does exactly that, that will count the number of vertices of a specific type. So here we're looking for, we're trying to count the number of person vertices that we have in our graph. Here we're trying to count the number of movie vertices. And then we also have get edge count, just like get vertex count, it counts the number of edges of a certain type. And then once again, we have uh, something called get vertices. So this will get all of the vertices of a particular type. And you can use some of our uh, GSQL functions in here, such as limit, select, where, sort, uh, in order to parse through uh, the results returned. So here I just have a limit. Uh, because as we do load in more data eventually, this return would get massive. Uh, so we're limiting it to uh, five users currently that would be, or five results that would currently be returned. So we're doing this for both person and movie. And then we are going to uh, print out our count of people, movies, and edges, as well as a sample of five of each of those people and movies. And as we can see, we currently have nothing in our graph. So we have zero people, zero movies, and zero edges. And we can't really describe any of them because there's nothing loaded in there. So the next thing we'll take a look at doing with PyTiger graph is actually loading in our data. So there are many different ways to do this, uh, depending on how much data you're trying to load and sort of what that data looks like. So I'll go through each one of those um, step by step. So the first thing to look at is upsert vertex. This function is useful if you only want to insert a single vertex, and uh, that's mainly it. So the format for this is we have our first input here is the type of vertex that we will be inserting. So this is a person vertex. And then we have our vertex ID. So this is the unique ID that our vertex will get. In this case, it's Dan, because that's our person's name. And for attributes here, we would have a JSON list of key value pairs with each of our attributes and the value that we're going to enter. If you recall from our schema further up, our person uh, node does not have any attributes. So we just simply give it an empty JSON object here. So if I run this now, we can see that uh, printing the results will give us a one. One vertex has been upserted. And if we really wanted to double check that, we could go over to our graph and we could see that we now have a Dan vertex. So if we run our get loaded stats function again, once again, we will see that we have one person, zero movies, zero edges. And here our person is described out by that function. So next let's look at adding a vertex that has attributes. So like I said before, it's going to be the same input, our type of vertex, our ID of our vertex, this has to be a unique identifier for each vertex type, and then our attributes. So here we have specified our attributes as our JSON object. So we have our title and our genres, and then we're just going to feed that into our upset vertex function. So once again, we'll just upsert that vertex. We have a one indicating that we've upserted one vertex and our get loaded stats now should show that we have one person and one movie. And there we go. And here we can see as well, those attributes listed out. So we have vertices now. So the next thing we need to take a look at is how we can create edges and what that looks like. This may look a little bit more complex, but really it's all pretty straightforward uh, once you get to understand it. So much like upsert vertex, we have upsert edge. And then there's a few more properties that we have to describe here just so our edge knows what it's doing. So the first thing we need is our source vertex type. So this is the type of vertex that our edge is coming from. In this case, our person is rating a movie. So our person is our source vertex. What specific vertex our edge should start at? So we created the Dan 
uh, person earlier. So we'll point our edge to that Dan person. This is that unique ID for that vertex. Next, we have the type of edge that we are creating. So if you remember from our schema, our edge is called rate. And then we have our source or our destination vertex type. So our rating is pointing to a movie. And again, we have the primary ID of that vertex that we are going to be pointing at. So we gave an ID of one to our movie earlier. So we're going to be pointing at, at ID one as well. And then finally, we have our attributes, which are in the same format as our upsert vertex uh, from earlier. And for our edge, we have two attributes, one of the actual rating and one of the date time that the rating was created at. So by running this function, upsert edge with those inputs, you can see we've created one edge. And now our handy get loaded stats function again, we'll be able to see that we have a person, a movie and one edge connecting. And we can see some more information about those as well. So that's helpful for loading in one vertex or one edge at a time, but obviously, you know, graph wouldn't really be the useful thing that it is if we just had uh, small amounts of data in it. So this is very useful for augmenting or uh, quickly testing things out if you need to insert a specific vertex to see if a value is breaking something or if you just uh, want to be able to easily add uh, one to two pieces of data at a time. That's kind of the way that you want to do that is through these upsert edge and upsert vertex functions. So next we'll look at how to load multiple vertices and or edges at a time. And this is a similar format to what we were doing with singular, single uh, vertices and edges. It's just a little bit different. So the main thing to note here, and we'll, I'll show this command first, the upsert vertices uh, function takes an input of a vertex type as well as then an array of what is essentially what we would feed into our upset ver upsert vertex function. So everything after the vertex type is more or less what we're feeding into our upsert vertices function. So that's what these lists are up here. So for example, our people, we have their unique identifier and then their attributes, which as you recall, the attributes, there are no attributes for our people vertices. And then with our movies, once again, we have the unique identifier and these actually do have attributes. Uh, so those are listed out there. You'll notice that each one of these is a list. And for our upset vertices function, we just take in that vertex type and then the list describing each one of the vertices that we want to create. So because we have to specify our vertex type when we run this function, you cannot use this function to upsert multiple different types of vertices at one time. You have to make a, a unique function call for each type of vertex that you're trying to upsert. So we'll just run this here and we'll watch it. And people is not defined. Oh, forgot to run this block. There we go. So we can see here that we have upserted three people, three movies, and three edges. And once again, get loaded stats, we will see that reflected. So there are all of our people, there are all of our movies. Um, and we can see that that is all loaded in the graph. So now, now that we have data in our graph, let's take a look at how we can get some more information about that data. So we have some functions here where we can get some statistics about our vertices as well as our edges. So I'll just run this and then I can talk about the what this function outputs and how that can be useful to you. So the first thing we'll notice here is that both our person and our movie returned blank results. Uh, that might seem a little bit odd at first. Uh, you know, we have people and we have movies loaded into our graph. Why aren't there any statistics on them? And that comes down to uh, the fact that statistics are only for numerical uh, data types. So for example, when we look at our um, rate edge, we can see that we have a rating which is a numerical value. And we can see that our statistics has returned a max rating, a min rating, and an average rating across all of those edges. And similarly for the date time, which those ratings were created at, we can see those expressed as epoch time 
uh, within our statistics here. So for date time, that might not be the most useful. It may be depending on what your data looks like, but for us that uh, rating here, these uh, statistics on ratings can be very useful uh, depending on what we're doing with our graph. It's also useful. There's a couple of things that we can note here with this get edge stats function. Uh, so when we look at this call down here, here we are specifying instead of just specifying a vertex type such as person or movie, we're specifying star, which will return all vertex types. So this get vertex stats star will return stats for all of our vertex types. But we can also see that here I've specified skip NA. So with our person and our movies, they don't have any numerical attributes to them. So there, there is nothing to get stats on. So because of that, the skip NA flag will cause us to skip over those and we will just return an empty um, object instead of person and movie like we had returned before with empty stats in them. So that can just be helpful if you're trying to get an overview of some of the numerical data in your graph, uh, things like this, like ratings, or if you have financial transactions or other things like that that are heavily uh, numbers based, these get stats functions can be useful for quickly exploring some of that information in your graph. Another thing that we can do is directly get certain vertices by their ID. So here we have get vertices by ID. We are looking to get a person vertex. And in this case, we are looking to get the person vertex with the unique ID of Dan. And then here we are looking to get uh, vertices. Uh, so we can see that we can get multiple vertices at once. Here we're specifying we want movie vertices and we're specifying IDs of two and four for those movies that we want to retrieve. Once again, you can only do one type of vertex at a time with this call but it is pretty flexible in the fact that you can grab multiple vertices. And this can come in uh, fairly handy when you're starting to do things programmatically through Python, being able to retrieve uh, lists of some of your vertex IDs and then feed them into this function in order to return uh, some more information about them. So here we can see it lists out the ID type and attributes of each one of the specified vertex vertices that we've been looking for. We also have some information that we can get about our edges. So uh, much like with vertices, knowing about our edges is pretty useful as well. So the first thing that we can look at is getting the edge count. So this is the number of edges that are connected to a specific vertex. So in our scenario, because it is a person rating a movie, if we're starting from a person, we will be looking, this edge count will represent the number of movies that they have rated because it's the number of edges coming from that person outward to our movies. And if we were to start at movie, then this edge count would represent the number of people who have rated that movie because it's the number of edges coming from people to that movie. Additionally, we can, so let's just run this and look at what we have. So for our first one, get edge count from person. So we can see that there are two edges of type rate and there are zero edges of type reverse rate because we did not create any reverse edges when we created our edges. And then we can additionally see that if we look for edge count from, so here we can specify the specific edge type that we would like to traverse. If our graph was more complex and we had multiple different edge types, say if this was some sort of um, social media movie rating platform where people could be friends with each other. We might have an edge coming from person going to another person, uh, maybe labeled friendship or something like that. So here we could specify that we only care about our rating edges when we are looking for our results. And then lastly, we can get not just the count of the edges, but we can get the actual edges themselves. This function is just like our get edge count from function where we can specify that we want all edges or we could specify a specific edge type that we would like to return. So from running this, we can see uh, we have two rating edges from our first call where we specify we want any type of edge. Here it's specified the type and the number. And then we say we just want our rate edges. We just return a number two because we already know what edge type we're looking for. And then when we're looking for all edge, these are just the outputs describing those edges, very similar to what we have when we run our get loaded stats function. 
So now that we've looked at loading in small amounts of data, exploring that data, getting stats on that data, let's go through uh, deleting that data just so we can go over some more um, features as well. So let's just have a look at the state of our graph currently. We can see that we have four people, four movies, four edges, and those are there. And we can use some of our delete vertex functions in order to remove certain uh, edges or vertices, or rather vertices just from this delete vertex vertices function. Uh, and we can do that here where we'll be deleting our person with the ID of Lena. So if we run this, we can see that we have deleted one. And if we run our get loaded stats again, here we can see that we will now only have three people loaded in rather than four. Something to note here is with this command, there is also a permanent flag that you can include. Uh, what this will do is uh, make sure, when you normally delete a vertex, it removes it and you could create another vertex with that same ID and that would sit perfectly fine in your graph. If you use this permanent flag, you cannot create any more vertices of that type with that unique ID uh, within your graph. So this just makes sure that that is um, permanently and fully deleted from your graph going forward. Here we're going to look at how we can delete some edges and sort of use some of our uh, built-in functions uh, where limit and sort in order to more intelligently do that. So the thing that we want to do here is delete any ratings that are less than 9.0. So if you'll recall, our edge rate has an attribute of rating that is um, a float. So we will look at that value, we will compare it to 9.0, and if it is lower, we will delete that edge. So here we will get our edge stats for rate. So this will tell us that we have four rate edges and this will just describe our stats. So we can see if we remember that we had a min of 7.3 and an average of 8.45. So both of those numbers are below nine. So that's why we want to go ahead and delete some of our ratings that are less than nine. So here we have delete edges and this does exactly what it sounds like. It deletes our edge. And we do need to specify here our starting vertex type, our starting vertex, and the type of edge that we are looking to delete. So we're looking to delete rate edges coming from our person, Nick. And with our where clause, we can specify that rating, which is our attribute, which contains that rating value, is less than 9.0. So this will only delete edges coming from Nick where the rating is less than 9.0. And we can see that after we run that, we have stats that are still a below nine. So why, why did that happen? So if you'll recall here, we're just deleting edges coming from our Nick person. Um, our person Nick didn't have any ratings or only had one rating below uh, 9.0. So we only deleted one rating from him. But Obviously, having to specify each vertex here is a pain. So let's take a look at how we can do that uh, utilizing Python to more efficiently do this deleting process. So the first thing we're going to do is get a list of our edges. So we're using our get edges by type function, and we're getting all of our rate edges. And then we're just going to parse through that list. So for edge in edges. We're going to look at the attributes of each one of those edges and their rating and see if that rating is less than nine. And if it is, then we're going to get the person that that edge comes from. So our from person attribute is our from ID from our edge. And then we're going to delete that edge using that person ID that we've retrieved uh, from our edge. So in long story short, what we're doing is we're getting a list of all of our edges of type rating. We're going through each one of those edges. We are checking to see if it has a rating less than 9.0. And if it does, then we are getting the user who that, or the person who that edge is connected to. And we are feeding that person ID into our delete edges function. So that way we can delete the edge coming from that person. 
So now if we just run, um, run that function, we can see that we've deleted a rating of 7.3 from Ben and a rating of 8.6 from Dan. So this shows that it is traversed through all of our people. Um, we can see multiple different people. And after deleting ratings less than 9.0, we're left with one rating edge left with a value of 9.2. And that's what we can see displayed in our stats here. So that's how we go ahead and delete edges of a specific type. Uh, what we can also look at now is how to just bulk delete uh, things in your graph. So if you want to drop all people or all movies that are currently loaded, we can do that just by running these delete vertices functions. So the only input to these delete vertices is a person. And then with most of our functions, we can also specify a where, a limit, or a sort, uh, which is done uh, through GSQL in order to limit or intelligently parse which of our vertices get deleted. We get our loaded stats now. We can see that we have zero vertices, zero people, zero movies, and zero edges in our graph. And that's what we're looking for. So obviously, we've gone through uploading small amounts of data, but that's not really the point of graph. So let's take a look here at how we can use some of our um, other functions to upsert large quantities of data into our graph. So the first thing we'll look at is uh, loading JSON data. So the JSON data that we can load into our graph follows this rough schema. So we have our opening JSON object with our first key being vertices, because we're specifying what vertices we want to load. That will open up into uh, where we can specify the vertex type, the vertex ID, and then any attributes within that vertex. And this will repeat out for all of the vertices that we are looking to load in this format. And then similarly, we have an entry for edges, what vertex they're coming from, what specific vertex ID they're coming from, the type of edge, the target vertex type, and the target vertex ID. You're starting to notice a pattern in here. This is because these inputs are exactly the same as the inputs that we used when we created one edge or one vertex, source vertex type, source vertex ID, edge type, target type, target ID. So it's a very similar format, just laid out in a different structure. And then of course, we have all of our attributes laid out under here as well. So here's an example uh, JSON that I created just to add people and movies to our graph. So we can hear, see here that we have our vertices specified that opens up into our person vertices of which we'll load in someone named Dan and someone named Ben. And then we have our movie vertices as well where we can see that we have a movie with the ID of one, which has the attributes of the title and genres, and then a movie with the ID of two with attributes, title and genres as well. And we can see the value for each one of those attributes is listed out here. And additionally, just to be thorough, we have edges and we can see that we have edges starting at um, type person. And that's all of our edges because we only have one type of edge. And then we can have listed out specifically the source ID, the edge type, the target vertex type, and the target vertex ID and then our attributes. So we can see here that we have two ratings for each of our people. So both Dan and Ben have each rated the two movies that we've created. And we can see the value of those ratings and the date time in which they were created. So that's just kind of our data represented as a JSON object. And we will up use upsert data with that JSON object in order to actually upsert that data into our graph. And here we can see that we've accepted four vertices and four edges. And once again, running get loaded stats, we have two people, two movies, and four edges. And there they are all described. So that's kind of a way to load intermediate amounts of data, uh, but that's still not really what we're looking for. So with TigerGraph, we have these things called loading jobs which are great for bulk loading large quantities of data from CSV files or other sources. Uh, so let's take a look at how we can use those loading jobs from within PyTigerGraph. We'll do this with PyTigerGraph's GSQL interface. So if you're familiar with TigerGraph, GSQL is the query language that TigerGraph uses. And there are a lot of different functions that you can do uh, with your TigerGraph instance through GSQL. 
So PyTigerGraph allows us to send GSQL commands directly to our TigerGraph server. And uh, we can see an example of that where here we're sending a GSQL LS, which will list out some of the information about our graph. So here we can see our vertex types, our edge types, and the information describing them, as well as any of the graphs that we have. But if you'll notice here that when we ran LS, we have this graph label here. So if you recall from earlier, when we were exploring our graph through Graph Studio, we had the ability to swap between a global graph and the actual graph that we're working with. So what we need to do is we need to specify to PyTigerGraph that we want to work with the my graph. So we can use our GSQL command to say, use graph my graph. We also have a, um, a function uh, connection dot use graph, and then you could specify the graph name as well. So we'll run that to establish our connection to our graph. And um, we cannot see the list of our, so normally what this would do is this would list out all of our loading jobs and those loading jobs would then be tied to, let's see, so we can see that our load data here, we have these two loading jobs that have already been created with our CSV files and these edges connecting them. And normally star would list out just all of your loading jobs. It looks like for some reason right now it is not giving us those. Uh, so anyway, that list that it would normally give you would contain in this format, uh, a list of all of your loading jobs, as well as what data they are accessing and uh, sort of where they are loading that data into. Strange, it's not showing right now. So let's try, See if we can specifically list one of these out just so you can see an idea of that output. Range. All right, so we will, let me throw a wrench in this. Um, but what we could do is we would get a list of loading job names. They would look something like this if they were created through the Graph Studio interface or if you created the loading jobs uh, by hand through GSQL, uh, then you would have the names that you would set for those loading jobs there. Additionally, you would have, uh, you would need to specify a data source for those loading jobs. So here we can see that we have a, a CSV file. One of the things to note here is that CSV file was loaded through the uh, Graph Studio web interface. So when you are doing uh, map data to graph here, if you upload a file using the add data file option, uh, those files get stored onto your Tiger Graph server. But if you don't have you know, direct access to your Tiger Graph server, sort of where do those files get stored if you're using a TG Cloud instance? So this is sort of the home path of um, any of those files that are uploaded through uh, Tiger Graph Cloud and how you can access them uh, for your loading jobs here. So you'd specify that data source, and then you would specify um, which loading job you are going to run that data source through, and you would run that. And this won't. Interesting. Let's grab my graph. See if I can figure out why this isn't showing our jobs really quickly. Hmm. Well, unfortunately, we won't be able to demonstrate that capability of loading in those jobs if we uh, can't view those jobs. I'll have to look into why that's not working right now on my instance. But uh, so what we would do with that is that would once again return our list of results, and we could use our data source here, our CSV file, in order to uh, run through that loading job and load in that dating data. However, if you don't want to use the Tiger Graph Cloud uh, interface to upload your data files, you want to upload a raw data file from your machine, you can do that as well by using um, some of our functions. So we have the ability to, we can feed that file, a local file in as a CSV, uh, just through a pandas data frame, or sorry, 
we can take a local file as a CSV and we can just upload that uh, to our job as well. So we can use the connection.upload file. We have our file name and then our file tag. So the file tag within our loading job that would be returned here, you would specify more or less a variable name for your file. So in your loading job, you would have a section that says um, using uh, this file as blank variable name. So here you just specify what that variable name is within your loading job. And then you also specify which loading job you are going to be using uh, to load that file through. So this upload file functionality allows you to do that. And then lastly, um, yeah, so we'll just run through, would have loaded in a bunch of our data here. Uh, from our get stats function, we would have been able to see then all of the data that we would have loaded into our graph, all of our movies, um, their genres, and so on. So lastly, we've taken a look at loading in data, uh, large amounts of data at once. Now let's take a look at actually querying that data. So we'll again be heavily relying on our uh, GSQL functionality of PyTigerGraph for this section. Uh, so if you don't know GSQL, highly recommended that you uh, take a look at it, um, take a look at query creation for kind of going through with this type of stuff, or you can just uh, jump in there and play around with it. Um, it is all good. So we'll want to create a new query and we can do this just like we would outside of PyTigerGraph with our GSQL command. So we'll be create query test query for graph my graph, and then we will print out, um, that query is just going to print out test query works. We are using a graph. Um, So let's use our, uh, here we'll use our function that's built into PyTiger graph. Oh. I don't know why our graph name isn't sticking there, uh, but, but normally you would be able to create this query after specifying uh, your graph that you might be able to Get a little hacky with it and do okay so that happened to work and we have added our test query directly to our graph so after that, we can then interpret our queries through uh, PyTiger graph as well. So many graphs, why is that not sticking? Um, so interpreting a query is different from running a query. Interpreting a query uh, does not require the query to be installed. And there are some limitations and performance drawbacks to interpreting a query. However, you do not have to sit through the uh, one to two minute install process that it would take to normally install a query. Um, and if you don't know the difference sort of between saving, installing and loading queries, uh, you can check that out uh, through these links here. So here we can see that we have run our query. Uh, we didn't have any errors. And for the results, we can see test query works. So now let's take a look at install. Oh, sorry. So one thing that we can do, so here we had two separate steps, one for creating our query uh, and then one for interpreting that query. But another thing that we can do is we can just run uh, an interpreted query straight from the uh, PyTiger graph interface here. So if we use run interpreted query, then we do not have to first create that in query and then run it, this will run that query um, as is without having to save it on your machine. So if we do this, we can see that it should print test query two works. If we Oh, 
normally we'd be able to see that test query two works, uh, but we were running into some issues today, it would look like. So otherwise, other than just interpreting queries, we have the ability to install them and run them fully. So we'll take a look here at what doing that looks like. So once again, yeah, it just does not like this. So we've created a query here uh, called recommend movies. And what this does is we will take a vertex person and we will look at movies that they have rated. And then we will find people who have rated the same movies. And then we will look at movies that those people have rated. And we will use that list uh, to try to suggest movies to our initial, um, initial seed individual. We don't have any data in there. We're not going to really get uh, the best results out of this query, but we can still uh, create it. And then we can also install it as well. So this install process will take a couple minutes uh, just to install that query. Like I said, this is kind of the difference between interpreting and installing a query. We will get better performance when actually running the query, but we do have to sit through this uh, brief install period. So while it's doing that, I'm going to attempt to load in uh, the rest of our data with our loading jobs. So let's see, we can get this to work now. We may have to wait for our query install to finish before this will return. So we'll just give that a second to finish installing, but it should only take about one to three minutes. So we can take a look, uh, while that's installing, we'll just take a look at uh, some of these inputs that our query does have. So we input our P, which is our starting person. Uh, so this is the unique ID of the person who we are looking to recommend movies to. And then we have K1 and K2. Uh, so K1 is uh, the number of people who have rated the same movies. So as you recall, we're going from our person outwards to the movies that they have rated. And K1 is the number um, and then from those movies, we are going out to all of the other people who have rated those movies. So K1 is the number of additional people we will get from each one of those movie ratings. And then K2 is the actual number of movies that we are going to recommend to our individual. So we're going to take the top 10 results of the top 50 movies that everyone who has rated any movies that our target person has also rated have rated and we're going to return those top 10 results uh, to our target person. So here we can see that our query has installed and if we scroll back up, let's just see if we can see our loading jobs now. There we go. So this is what this should look like. So here we can see that we have loading job uh, load ratings.csv and loading job uh, movies CSV. And this is where we can see that file name uh, that I was talking about. So as your loading jobs go, this specifies uh, that unique variable that the actual CSV file or whatever data file is going to be loaded in as. So here we can see that the name of that variable is my data source. And we're going to load my data source to edge um, rate. And our values are going to be the first four lines of our, or the first four columns of our CSV. And we're going to use separator. Yeah. So this is all just standard loading job stuff. Uh, but mainly what you need to know is that this will correspond to your loading jobs here. So that one is this, for example. And if we map data, we can see here are the four columns of our CSV, which is what those numbers, um, dollar sign zero through dollar sign three, correspond to. And we can see how they map out to the different fields. So our user ID goes to our user ID, our movie ID, movie ID rating goes to our edge attribute rating, and the timestamp is our rated at date time. 
So that's just, if you want to get more into loading jobs, I believe I've included a link here, but otherwise you can find some great links on our Tiger Graph uh, documentation, uh, just specifying how to format a loading job if you're looking to create one of those through GSQL. So now that we actually have the names of our loading jobs and their numbers, we can um, load in our data. So I'm just going to do that now as described before. So this will take our, well, normally this would take our CSV file, uh, which was on our server and run it through this loading job, load job movies, load job movies. Um, we have those same number identifiers and using data source is that data source. So my data source is what we called that variable when we created our loading job. And then data source was the name of the CSV file that we're actually loading. So let's jump back quickly to our queries. And we have our query installed and let's just run it now. So we unfortunately won't get the best results because if you recall, we do only have uh, those two people and two movies in our graph, but we can still run this across them. So for our P, we'll change that to one of our vertices, which is Dan. We'll attempt to return 10 movies, but there are only two movies that we can return. So we will run our installed query. This is our uh, PyTiger graph function, which will run an installed query. And then we can also use one of our PyTiger graph functions, parse query output to better format the output of our query results. Like I said, this is not gonna be very interesting because we don't have enough data in our graph, but we would have gotten a return um, from our query listing out the movies that were recommended as well as any of the vertices and edges that it sort of touched along the way. So similarly, we have some more um, graph oriented functions that we can do within PyTiger graph. Uh, some of those involve uh, sort of pathfinding. So pathfinding allows us to traverse from one vertex to another vertex. And uh, with pathfinding, we can attempt to find the shortest path between vertices. So for example, if we had two users and we wanted to see if there was a movie that they had both rated, uh, then that would be our shortest path between those two users because user one would have a rating edge connecting them to a movie and then user two would have a rating edge connecting them to that same movie. So that would be our shortest path would be from one user through a movie back to another user. If those two users hadn't rated the same movie, then we would have uh, potentially a longer path uh, where maybe user A rated a movie that user B rated and user B then also rated another movie and that movie was rated by um, user C, who's the target user that we were looking to connect to user A. Because of the vertices in our graph right now, I just need to change this a little bit, but we can see that our connection dot shortest path. So this will run our shortest path algorithm and we'll go from person Dan to person Ben. And we can see that our shortest path there is through um, from the Dan vertex through the movie with ID of two to the Ben vertex. We both rated, those two people have both rated the same movie. And we can see that from this shortest path function. This also returns uh, some more information about any of the edges that we might've passed through. So here for this scenario, we could have traversed our reverse rate edge if we wanted to traverse backwards. So if we are going from our movie back to, um, or actually, sorry, we go from our person, our starting person of Dan through the rate edge to our movie. And then from our movie, we go through our reverse rate edge because we're traversing backwards to our person then. So because that rating is directional, person rates movie, when we travel backwards, so from a movie to a person, we have to traverse that reverse rate edge. So that's why we see that listed out here. Additionally, we can find all paths. So this is uh, similar to shortest path except it's not just limited to the shortest path. This will attempt to find any path between those two people. And we can limit uh, the length of those paths with this variable here. So the longest paths here are unfortunately also our shortest paths because we just have those two people and two movies loaded into our database currently. But 
uh, if we did have a, our full data set loaded, we would have some very long paths that we could traverse. Um, so here we're just limiting that function to uh, for traversals. And here we can see just as we had before with our shortest path listed out our, our paths um, and the edges that we can traverse to get along from them. So now let's take a look at uh, some of the ways that we can use PyTigerGraph to integrate some of our other Python packages. So uh, PyTigerGraph has native pandas support, so support for pandas data frames. So if we run this, we can see that we are getting, ah, we don't have those maybe specifying in a second. Okay, so get vertex data frame will do pretty much exactly that. So we are looking to get a data frame representing all of our movies. So get vertex data frame type vertex type movie. Additionally, in here, you could use uh, your where select and limit clauses uh, if you wanted to be more specific with exactly which vertices you were receiving. And we'll just print out that data frame here, which will just show uh, the two movies that we've received. Then additionally, what we can do is get vertex data frame by ID. So just like get vertex data frame, this allows us to only select specific IDs that we are looking to return. If we wanna be even more selective uh, rather than just using our where limit or sort clauses. And we can see that because these are the only two, we've selected them here. So I guess a better representation of this would just be to select uh, one movie. And we can see that it's just selected that one movie here. Additionally, uh, we can convert a, uh, the results of a query. So we can convert the results of uh, getting vertices into a pandas data frame with our vertex set to data frame function. So here we can see we received a person Dan through our standard get vertices by ID function. And that has returned uh, that vertex in as a list of a JSON object uh, with our uh, vertex information within it. And if we wanted to convert that into a pandas data frame, we can just use vertex set to data frame on that result. And that will then convert that into this data frame representing the same information above. Additionally, this works as well with edges. So um, let me change this. We have actually get data. And we have get edges data frame, which will return all edges coming from a specific vertex type with a specific vertex ID. So this will get all edges connected to our Dan vertex limited by three. And we can see that we return those here as a data frame. And there are only two because there are only two edges. And then we can also have our uh, edge set to data frame function. So much like our vertices, we can get our vertex set as, or sorry, our edge set from our standard get edges function. And we can then convert that into a data frame. So let's take a look now at some of the other functions uh, and just helpful blocks of code. So if you're looking to connect uh, to your TigerGraph solution from uh, PyTigerGraph, this is really the block of code that you wanna copy and paste. This is all of your imports, this, sets up your connection variables, host name, graph name, um, your secret, should you be using one, and your username and password. It establishes your connection. It generates a token, should you need one, and then it establishes the connection again with that authorized token for you. It also sets your graph. Um, so that's, that's really, if you're looking for something to get started using PyTigerGraph, um, hop into this notebook, copy and paste that block, and you'll be connected to your TigerGraph instance and ready to go with PyTigerGraph. Additionally, we have this get loaded stats function uh, that I was using throughout the demo. This will show those stats for everything in your graph. It's handy just in case you're doing uh, some data manipulation and you wanna make sure that things are actually deleting, things are actually being inserted. You wanna see how those changes are being reflected in your graph. This is a useful um, function to have with you as well. Additionally, we can do some token management through uh, PyTigerGraph. So like I said, we were using those tokens to 
authenticate for some of our more secure transactions like deleting and upserting data. Uh, so you can manage your tokens for your Tiger Graph instance as well through here. Um, the refresh token will generate a new token for you. I'm not going to run that now because that would uh, not allow, you know, I would have to reestablish my token in order to um, reconnect back to my server, but you can specify the, um, you will need a secret to create your token. So you can get your secret from your graph. And this will, um, you can also specify the lifetime of that token. So this is in seconds, um, the lifetime in seconds. And then additionally, you can delete any token uh, from its secret. So there's a bit more info that we can get from our graph. So we can use connection.echo just to make sure that we actually do have a connection. Uh, so we can see that there. We can get a list of all of the endpoints that our graph has. So any of most of the functionality offered through Tiger Graph is also offered as uh, REST API endpoints. Uh, so here we can see a list of all of those endpoints and uh, what they look like. So a get request to query graph name recommended movies would run our recommended movies query. And here we can see the inputs that it is expecting there. So you can kind of scroll through this and see uh, for everything, all of the REST endpoints that your server has, they will be listed out here. And if you want a list of sort of what's available by our REST endpoints without having to run this uh, command, we have that listed in our documentation as well. Uh, so you can see how you can interface with your Tiger Graph instance from uh, via REST endpoint for whatever your application may be there. We can also get our installed queries with our connection.get installed queries. So this will show us any of our installed queries. As you recall, uh, when we were installing, we, although we did run three queries, we ran our first test query and then we ran our interpreted test query um, without installing, without saving it. And then we ran our recommended, we installed and then ran our recommended movies query. So we only see those two, um, that first test query that we actually installed and the recommended movies query that we also installed. Those would be the only ones saved uh, that will be returned here. We can also look at statistics. So these are, we're not going to see any right now um, because we haven't really run any of those queries, but these are statistics on the queries that you have run. This is their performance and some more information about how those, uh, how query performance has been impacted over time. We don't really have a long log of um, historical query data, so we're not going to get anything useful out of this function, but if you do have a graph that you have been running queries on, this will return statistics on all of those queries. Additionally, we can get some version information about our graph uh, with get version and get ver. So get version will return a list of the versions of all of the different pieces of the Tiger Graph product and your server, whereas get ver will allow you to specify specifically um, what you want to get the version of. So here I'm specifying I want the version of the GPE. And we can see in our main um, get version that our GPE is returned sort of in line with all of this other stuff. However, when we run get for GPE, we just get our version number as our return. Another function that Python Tiger Graph offers is our ability to view the UDTs on our Tiger Graph server. So UDTs are user defined types. Um, so certain queries may require a UDT or you may be using UDTs um, to interface with your data differently through Tiger Graph. Our sample server does not have any UDTs. So we will see that these will both return empty, um, but you can specify get UDTs, which will list all of them. Or if you're only looking for a specific UDT, you can use get UDT and specify the name of that UDT that you are looking for. And then lastly, we have our secret management which we can use to show all of our secrets as well as any tokens that are linked to that secret. So here we can see our token as well as its expiration date and um, all of that's lined out. We can see the graph name that that is created for and the alias that we created. So this is from at the very beginning of this when we went to our admin portal and we created our test secret. We can see that that was um, established here. So that, that is it. That was a lot, but that is uh, the functionality that Python Tiger Graph offers. Um, sorry, we had some issues with the demo earlier with that data loading, 
Um, I will look into those to see if those were specifically related to my um, graph or if those are an issue with the notebook or something that has changed on our end. Um, but otherwise, uh, this notebook typically will function perfectly well and can give you a good idea of how to use each one of these functions to interface with Python Tiger Graph. Um, yeah, so I guess I will open it up now to questions. Um, I'm going to jump over to the Q&A and stop sharing my screen to see if there is are any questions I can answer. All right, so there are a lot of questions. Sorry, it might take me a minute to scroll through some of these. Um, I'm seeing one about visualizations through the notebook. And yes, we can, uh, if you were to import a visualization library, you could easily feed the results of these queries into your visualization library like Plotly. Um, and you could uh, quickly and easily visualize those results within the, um, within the notebook itself. Yeah, so um, that's the majority I'm seeing for questions. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and I hope that you learned something uh, from this webinar and that hopefully it uh, makes you wanna pick up PyTigerGraph and give it a shot for your next project that involves TigerGraph and Python together. Okay, thanks Dan. And John, I think uh, John answered a lot of the questions in Q&A um, and we'll send a link to the recording and, and all the links that you shared today as well in an email later today. Great, thank you all for attending. Yeah, have a great day.